a warm welcome from my side. Um, uh, my name is Victoria Halder and together with my colleague Andreas Beham, um, I'm uh, chairing this session, which is called Integrated Logistics Planning for Efficient Smart Manufacturing. And um, we have four very interesting talks today. So um, the first one is called the association between network centrality measures and supply chain performance, the case of distribution networks. Um, um, and the talk is today given by Christian uh, Wallmann. And so please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Just let me see whether it still works. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't, but uh, I share my desktop then. It's no problem, take your time and everything will be fine. Does it work now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, uh, my name is Christian. Uh, I work at the University of Applied Sciences as well in the logistic department. Um, and uh, I give a talk about uh, social network analysis, basically, and how it would relate to logistic performance. So the introduction will be a quick introduction to social network analysis. And uh, then I'll go into more detail about this relation between social network centrality uh, and performance in general. So social network centrality gives you an indicator about performance in your network. And this is uh, what we have shown. And then highlight, I highlight some conclusions and uh, future research. Let me quickly start uh, with a bit uh, of an advertisement for supply chain management uh, usage of social network analysis. Uh, so in this uh, cited uh, one of the 10 most downloaded articles from the Journal of Supply Chain Management. It's about social network analysis in the supply chain context. Uh, this was introduced basically 2009 uh, to this more general technique of social network analysis. And the authors there argue that the network perspective the perspective has the potential to be a unifying force that can bring together many different streams of management research, including SCM, supply chain management, uh, into a coherent management science perspective. I agree, he says. I also agree, I need to say. And um, I'll show you a bit more in detail what social network analysis can do now and what it is. Um, so let me just say social network analysis uh, is the study of social networks. Uh, it consists of a uh, network consists of actors that are called nodes and edges, uh, which are social relationships in the social context. But it could also be business relationships or other dependencies. So it's a very general framework to analyzing uh, social relations or uh, relationships in general. Uh, and the main aim of social network analysis is to identify central nodes. Um, what are central nodes in your network? Uh, social network analysis, are, uh, social networks are represented by a graph. Um, and here we talk about the directed graph um, because it's a supply uh, relation. Um, and just a couple of examples, uh, the picture uh, at the top uh, right, uh, you see there is one cent uh, central node in the middle because if this node would fail, uh, then the network would fall apart. That's between the centrality. Uh, it measures somehow um, whether node con uh, controls the product flow. Then there is decrease centrality, uh, where you see that a uh, node uh, that has many connections um, is uh, central. And then there is eigenvector centrality, which basically says that if you connect it to other central nodes, you are more important or more central than other nodes that are connected uh, to less central nodes. So it's the quality of the relationships uh, that matter. And um, so um, let me, you might think, well, this is just uh, easy, uh, clear cut. Uh, there are the centrality measures you can identify click quickly who is central. But let me quickly show you another example. Let's say we are interested in a, a German car manufacturer and you consider the suppliers at the first tier level. So first tier suppliers means the sub direct suppliers. Then you see, okay, uh, in the case of uh, the German manufacturer, it would be probably 6,000 or something like that. That's just an excerpt uh, by a database, which is called Bloomberg. And then if you iterate that and you uh, look at the suppliers of the suppliers, uh, then you already uh, have a much more nodes. And then uh, if you go to the fourth 
uh, stop a step of uh, supply relationship, uh, you have already uh, a lot of uh, connections. So it's difficult to find out who can be central here in this network. I mean, obviously, by uh, looking at it, you can see it. So social network analysis is a technique to transform these complex networks to smaller networks where you especially see who is central. Uh, and uh, here you see the central nodes and how they are connected uh, in such a uh, complex network. So why does this matter? Basically, uh, in a supply network, uh, you have always suppliers that are somewhere hidden in your supply network. They are not your direct suppliers, but suppliers of your direct suppliers or suppliers of your suppliers uh, of, uh, and so on. And uh, to identify them, you first need the visibility, so you first need the data uh, to identify them. And then in a later step, um, you need to apply some analysis where you can identify them. And that's um, what you can do with social network analysis. So you can identify central suppliers that are somewhere in your supply chain. Um, and the concept that is uh, here is a nexus supplier that is somewhere in your supply network, but uh, even the uh, you most don't know where it is um, and I'm not going into detail here but um, the, the centrality measures on social network analysis can help to identify these uh, nexus suppliers somewhere hidden uh, in your supply chain but nevertheless important. Okay, so what was the main purpose of the paper? Uh, so this distribution networks, as you have seen already a picture, so distribution network is um, a network that um, leads from a plant um, or manufacturing uh, uh, production site uh, to a specific uh, dealer uh, or to a specific customer. So it's uh, you distribute finished goods uh, to a dealer or to an order or to a customer and these distribution networks are highly connected uh, nowadays and consist of a high number of network nodes i showed you a picture but uh, you can imagine uh, that's quite standard uh, that net, um, distribution networks are highly connected multinational and so on there exists a hypothesis that there exists a relationship between structural features and uh, performance uh, and this uh, hypothesis has been uh, justified on theoretical grounds. Uh, what, this is called network theory. I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. And it was also confirmed empirically. There have been a lot of studies where you study uh, whether some centrality measures are connected to performance and performance here is then measured in terms of, let's say, financial performance, uh, uh, or in uh, number of innovations. And uh, we, did, we confirmed it, for instance, for financial performance as well, that there is a connection between social network analysis uh, measures and financial performance. But uh, what is missing in the literature is that, there, uh, that this uh, relationship has just been established for supply networks and it hasn't been tested uh, for distribution networks. And that's the one point. And on the other, uh, the other point is that it always has been tested on company external data, uh, like external data database and this data is mobile, probably more or less reliable than internal data where you get the data directly from the company. And uh, our contribution is that we confirm the relationship between structural features um, and performance in distribution networks and uh, do this by a, a large company internal data set. Um, and uh, structural features are always measured by social network centrality in our case. Just to give you a quick flavor, uh, if you look, of the, uh, you look at the picture at the right, uh, you see that um, the entrepreneur, the red dot in the middle, has an advantage uh, over the other nodes because it's connected to all um, islands in this network. And uh, there is a structural hole uh, between uh, uh, this one, so on the left side and on the right side, uh, because these uh, nodes are only connected via the entrepreneur. So here is a strategical um, advantage, and uh, this is basically the idea that um, in uh, that the performance in the um, network or your own performance depends a lot on the structure in which you are embedded. So it depends on 
um, your network structure and uh, the choice of success uh, on individuals is often to try to be explained on basis of network properties. So entrepreneur is successful because uh, there is no structural hole for him. Um, and uh, so the question is then does this apply to supply chains? And uh, the idea is that uh, supply chains are complex networks as, as well. Uh, there are a lot of nodes, a lot of edges, and it seems to be that there is a relationship between in, um, um, how an individual node in a network, in a supply network or in a distribution network would perform uh, given his network stru uh, structure. And uh, of course, supply chains are just very complex because of globalization, uh, a lot of outsourcing into China and other uh, Asia countries, uh, geographical dispersion, uh, financial markets, um, uh, coronavirus, um, all these kind of things indicate that the network structure should matter uh, for performance. So our hypothesis was then that um, so high degree centrality of a node uh, leads to a large operational load. Uh, you need to reconcile a lot of conflicting schedules or interests between others and it's difficult to manage incoming material and outgoing material. That's clear because if you have high degree centrality you are connected to many other nodes and that means that it's difficult for you to uh, reconcile all these conflicting um, yeah, tasks. And uh, it seems that uh, therefore the more nodes are downstream of a node, uh, the more telling it is it is for a firm to ensure on-time delivery, cost-effective inventory or uh, order management for the customers. So it seems that uh, if you are connected to many nodes, it's difficult to keep a high performance in terms of delivery, inventory, um, and so on. And that's what we hypothesis. Therefore, uh, nodes with high degree centrality will suffer from higher inventory, higher stay times, and higher stay time variation. So what was our data set? Our data set um, was, uh, this was a, a data set by a German uh, uh, car manufacturer. It uh, contains 1.2 uh, billion vehicles per half year uh, from 15 plants uh, to over 2,000 dealer via 317 nodes. So it's a distribution network and we had timestamp data available when did uh, a node, uh, when did a vehicle leave a certain source uh, and when did it arrive at a certain target uh, through its whole distributional uh, path. And of course several different different transportation were involved. So in total, we had 1.2 million vehicles from origin to destination and timestamps available for this. Then uh, we analyzed these data points for the relationship between network centrality measures and performance. So the network centrality measures we calculated with social network centrality uh, and uh, the performance, uh, we uh, just aggregated the stay times um, and the inventory. So the mean stay time was one, how long did it stay? Um, so longer stay times uh, versus perfor performance. Standard deviation, how uh, difficult are stay times to plan? The higher the standard deviation, the more difficult. Um, and inventory, the, high in, the higher the inventory, the, the worse the performance. And then we carried out an ordinary least square, square regression with uh, controls type of location uh, and volume passing. So it obviously depends on the type of location as well, because if you, for instance, have a vehicle distribution center, you will have a high degree uh, because you uh, distribute too many uh, nodes. And uh, on the other hand, you will have long waiting times. So you need to control for this influences. Our results were as follows. Um, there are basically um, correlations, strong correlations between all centrality measures and all, um, in, um, all performance measures. Um, and uh, this is quite interesting, uh, but nevertheless, uh, because there might be an issue with confounding via the other variables, we need to control for um, the other variables, as I mentioned, uh, volume and um, basically kind of um, location. And then our results were somehow different. 
um, the regression result here for state times, standard deviation of state times, so variation of state times, we see that only really in the fifth model that only decreased centrality is associated significantly uh, with performance here uh, with uh, standard deviation of state times. Same result here uh, for the mean state time. So the relation for mean state time is the uh, is the weakest basically, um, and also only decreased centrality is associated associated here uh, significantly with um, um, mean state time. And the same holds for inventory. For inventory, um, the relationship is strongly. If you look at the fifth, the most strongest. If you look at the fifth uh, model um, with all the controls, um, and uh, of course, volu volume is also a strongly associated, associated with inventory because inventory basically says how long your mean stay time is, um, how long uh, individuals stay in, on average, uh, shipments stay on average, um, and uh, basically volume is here trigger. So, to sum up results, uh, considering only this descriptive statistics, there's a highly significant correlation between all centrality measures and all dependent variables. However, uh, if you look at uh, lists or uh, ordinary list uh, square regression with control type node and volume passing, we observed that there's only a significant effect of decreased centrality on the uh, performance measures, which somehow is a bit surprising. I need to say why it's only decreased centrality. Okay, what's the conclusions? Um, so what are our theoretical contributions? Basically, uh, we confirm the applicability of network theory in the context of distribution networks, uh, and that's the first uh, research that's doing that. Uh, I think uh, it's also the reason is also that uh, such a data set uh, of distribution networks is not too much available uh, because you often do not get the data from uh, the company. Uh, so, and in addition, this large data set and this high quality company internal data uh, give us at least a feeling that uh, there is less going on in terms of confounding uh, than it would, and in terms of bias, than it would be if we use external data. Our practical contribution is then uh, that managers may anticipate performance of network nodes based on network centrality measures only. Why is this important? Uh, because it's it's easier to get um, uh, network data than uh, performance data. So to get uh, timestamp data is always difficult and we observe this with our company partners as well. It's always easier to get the network structure, uh, but it's more difficult to get uh, performance data or timestamp data where you uh, have data on the flows of goods. And uh, what about future work? So of course we could control for additional variables like shipment frequencies, uh, imports, and ge geographical location of the node and uh, we could also analyze reasons for different effects of different centrality measures. So for me it's still surprising uh, that decreased centrality is the only network centrality measure that is associated with uh, with performance. So we didn't expect it in the beginning. And you could also do mediation analysis and could uh, look for instance on the um, uh, mediate uh, um, volume because volume is influenced by degree and uh, volume also influences the performance measures, so it might be that uh, this would probably increase effects and give you a more realistic picture. So that's it. Here's the, re uh, the reference. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Christian, uh, for this very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Please feel free uh, to ask by uh, raising your hand or just uh, start talking if this doesn't work. I do not see any raised hands at this very moment. Um, I would have uh, one or two quick questions. Um, actually, um, you, you um, like with your findings, you can uh, definitely uh, support the uh, hypothesis that the more nodes uh, there are, um, um, the harder several performance measures uh, become. Um, so do you have already talked to the company like um, how they could meet these challenges? 
Uh, no, actually we didn't, uh, but we mentioned these results uh, to them uh, and uh, we are working on, um, yeah, giving, I mean, it's different. Um, yeah, I think um, for it's, it's it's quite interesting for the companies to get a feeling who are the the uh, central nodes. So if you show, for instance, in these distribution networks, over, companies over wouldn't also also not know who are the central nodes there. And so this is quite important to give them the results from social network analysis, and then that's an indicator of performance. Um, and then they might look at these nodes and see we'll monitor these nodes, for instance, and uh, see what's happening there. So that's what we do in our project as well. So we uh, highlight central nodes uh, and then we say these might be nodes that should be monitored in the future to avoid performance issues. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, there is one question now from, uh, from Andreas. Hi Andreas, by the way. <laughs> Please. Hi. Um, uh, yes, Hello. I have a, a, maybe a quick question. I just wanted to, to know if you have thought about this. Because uh, as you start, maybe on the first phase, you are kind of uh, exploring and, and visualizing and portraying uh, the network. But um, as you then make recommendations, or as people derive recommendations from these uh, visualizations, that something changes to the, in, in this network. Uh, do, do, what, what do you think about this, this influence between um, acting upon such information? Do you also plan to do analysis on on maybe how certain changes would uh, would be uh, what would the effect be of certain changes in there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we could do it. I mean, there are two things. So the first question is whether we could do it with the companies and test it for the companies. I think that would be difficult to change the network structure for the companies uh, because this would take some some time. Um, but it would be easier to do some simulations uh, where we do some knockout studies, for instance, knock one node out and then consider the performance again. Uh, I think this would be more doable than uh, applying it to a company company context because you wouldn't just be able to change the network uh, because this would be a too long term effect, but uh, you could take some notes out and see how the performance would change then. Mm -hmm. okay. Hypothetically at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I don't see any more raised hands. Um, Christian, once more, thank you for this very interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, so, so we come to the um, to the second presentation. It is a pleasure introducing I, um, Martin Gutia is now talking about uh, heuristic approaches for scheduling jobs and vehicles in a cyclic, flexible manufacturing system. Please, Martin, the stage is yours. Martin, we do not hear you at the moment. You're muted. Martin, I will. Perfect. Uh, ah, <coughs> Sorry. Now we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. But you can see the presentation, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we also. Okay, see okay. You. <laughs> so thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Martin Gutier. I'm from the Johannes Kepler University of Linz, and I will give you uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'll give you some insights into my research into heuristic approaches for scheduling jobs and vehicles in a cyclic flexible manufacturing system. This has been a joint work together with Hans Keller from the University of Graz, as well as my PhD supervisor, Sophie Parag, also from the University of Linz. So a general overview of the problem that we are regarding. The problem is called a cyclic flexible manufacturing system or the overall system we're regarding is a cyclic flexible manufacturing system. Uh, I've jotted down a small, um, small graphic here on basically what you can expect. When you think of that, you start out from a depot and all of the jobs that need to be processed have to be moved from stage to stage. So we've got a set amount of jobs to be processed that need to be processed at each of the stages throughout the entire system with the help 
of automated guided vehicles. So our idea here is to have automated guided vehicles follow along this track from stage to stage and transport the jobs independently after being let go from a depot at one time. Um, the flexible part of our problem stems from the fact that we consider multiple machines at each stage. So we have capacity for multiple jobs to be processed at each single stage. Furthermore, the considered problem is overall uh, would overall fall into the category of flow shop problems. So we consider that all of the jobs that we regard here have to be um, have to be processed consec uh, consecutively at each of the stages. So a uh, general overview of the regarded problem and the objectives that we consider. This problem is um, uh, be has basically stemmed from some research from Jacek Blasevich that was published in 1998, back in 1998 actually, where he for, uh, looked at a very similar problem, except he uh, did he basically um, solved a similar problem and looked at whether or not it was possible at all to fulfill a given schedule with a certain number of vehicles. In our case, we're looking at a more general approach. We want to minimize two objectives at the same time. We want to A, minimize the total time needed. So the total time needed until our jobs have returned to the depot after being um, completely processed at each of the stages that we regard. And on the other hand, we want to minimize the number of AGVs used for transportation. And these two, these two objectives um, very obviously collide. The less AGVs we have, the higher the total time is going to be. And then for some constraints, what are we regarding as constraints for our problem? Well, as I said, previously mentioned quickly, all jobs have to be processed at all stages and then finally returned back to the depot with one last transportation um, procedure. We've got a set amount of machines at each stage, which may only pro process a single job at a time. We've got a one job per AGV rule, which means every single of these autonomous vehicles may only carry a single job at a time. And we need processing at all machines in correct order. Furthermore, and this is uh, a little bit differing from um, some research in this direction, we introduce a no waiting clause. No waiting in our case entails that we consider um, the unloading and loading operation of a job to basically cost no time. So you can basically say the, the speed of the transportation is so that there is a crane at the side of the track or something similar, which can immediately pick up the job without the AGV losing any specific amount of time. Furthermore, and the same thing then goes the other way, the AGV may not wait around for a job that is still being processed currently. So there's only picking up of jobs that are already done being processed. So for some problem variants that we regarded for this problem, we regarded some different scheduling rules uh, for the uh, for the machines on each stages. On the one hand, we consider the permutation schedule, which means all of the jobs have to be uh, processed at each of the stages in the order that they leave the depot. So we predetermine an order for the jobs to leave at the depot, which then under A for the permutation schedule stays consistent throughout the entire problem. And then for the second part, we introduce a first come first serve rule, which here entails that some jobs may overtake others through the flexibility of our problem. This happens uh, quite some time. If, um, if a job is significantly faster on a parallel machine, then it will immediately be able to be picked up by the following AGV for transport to the latter stage. Starting times of AGVs, this is actually um, this is our basically our decision variable of the whole problem. So this is what we want to optimize. We consider time to be discrete in this case. So our entire idea here is to look at um, possible starting points for every single AGV, starting at the depot and then cycling 
the entire track until the entire uh, problem is finished, until all jobs have been completed and finally uh, delivered back to the depot. We have each row for a single vehicle with a single set starting point and each column for a time t. In this case, we have vehicle one starting at zero, which means uh, up upon the start of the program and vehicle two starting at after time four. In our case, we can say that uh, one vehicle should, or should most likely always start at time zero as everything else would simply delay the whole system by a unit. So, for our solution ev evaluation, we use a simulation of the entire problem. How does this approximately look like? Well, I prepared a small animation for you to regard while I'm explaining this. So basically we have, this is just a single AGV case. Basically we have an AGV starting from the depot, taking the first job to the first stage. The first job gets processed and upon return to the depot, the AGV picks up the next job and continuously cycles the track until the whole problem is done. So in this case, it stops after two laps. This is just to give you an idea of, um, of the whole system with a single AGV. Obviously, we are then regarding and optimizing for multiple AGVs at the same time. And we use this in a programmed manner. We use this simulation to obtain the objective value for every considered vehicle schedule. So for the solution approach of this problem, how did we uh, try and come by a solution for this entire problem? Since it's <clears throat> rather difficult to optimize the transportation between uh, of jobs between machines. So we looked at a heuristic approach and specifically we looked at a local search. If we regard time as discrete, the local search has the advantage that the neighborhood um, has, that there's a very, um, a very decent way to regard the neighborhood. Since you may simply move the starting times by a single unit of time. So in our case, we simply say, okay, we have the list of the amount of, of the number of AGVs that we consider, and we are simply moving the starting time, the starting times of a single AGV at a time, back or forth. So this is <coughs> this is uh, our neighborhood is basically built through all of these possible moves through all of the AGVs in uh, going a single step. And a local search basically runs until a solution cannot be improved within a neighborhood and then restarts with new values. Now, going more into detail about the local searches that we used, we implemented two different local search variants that have some difference in the perturbation phase. On the one hand, we've got an iterated local search where we simply uh, have a perturbation step to escape the local optimum and then go into depth again to try and find the local optimum and simply jump out again with each of these jumps being considered a single iteration. Then. On the other hand, we implemented a variable neighborhood search where we every time we do not find a um, uh, possible, um, where every time we do not find a better solution, we simply increase the amount of vehicles to reschedule in a single iteration. So instead of one vehicle to reschedule, we go up to two and then onwards until we finally find a new schedule again. So this, this ever increases the neighborhood until you find a new solution. So basically looks something like this. If we start out with the initial solution, then we are looking at, uh, at the option at the options within the neighborhood of rescheduling a single vehicle and then going onwards, rescheduling multiple vehicles at a time up until we actually find a solution that is better than the best previous known solution and then we simply uh, restart in the next iteration so going from the new found best solution. Display of solutions, uh, how do we actually regard or how do we uh, evaluate the solutions that we found in the end? Well, we are looking at optimizing 
uh, for two different objectives. On the one hand, we want to minimize uh, the number of vehicles used and so the number of the AGVs that we use in our uh, in our system. And on the other hand, we want to minimize the time. So in our case, we decided to go for a display as a Pareto Frontier and regard different numbers of vehicles in different uh, uh, stored separately. So we've got, we then get a Pareto Frontier that displays the best found value for each different number of vehicles. And then we can just use uh, a cost function, for example, to pick the preferred solution out of the ones we generated. So for the evaluation of the achieved results, what did we actually achieve with um, with our approaches? Um, in general, since this is a, um, a topic that has not had that much um, research being research going towards, um, we um, we generated some test instances and then compared the solution achieved with the local searches to uh, a brute force approach as far as possible. So basically we the, uh, we programmed um, a brute force approach that used some, some tricks to uh, reduce overall calculation time and tried, uh, tried to uh, optimize uh, try to get the optimal solution, the guaranteed optimal solution for uh, at least some of the considered instances within uh, a 48 hour run time frame. And then we compare all of the solutions that we got from the local searches as well as the brute force approach by hyper volume indicator. The instances that we solve to optimality, we compare uh, by the percentage of the optimum, so of the optimum obtained with said brute force approach, and the instance is not solved to optimality, we compare the absolute value amongst, e amongst uh, each other. We have some different considered instance sizes. We, uh, we go from 10 up to 40 machine stages. So the machine stages are the different stages located alongside the track. And then furthermore, we are distinguishing between 25, 50, 100, and one final instance, uh, instance size with a total of 250 jobs that need to be processed on every single of the machine stages. So now looking into some of the achieved results for the instances we solved to optimality, uh, unfortunately, because uh, brute force approach was uh, just that a uh, quick way to get some optimal solutions, but um, here is some possible work to be done we managed to solve uh, three of the comparable instances uh, within 48 hours. And here we have, um, here we have the, the hyper volume percentages of our, of our heuristics, which are consistently above 99%. And for the instances we have not solved to optimality, we compare by absolute value of the hyper volume indicator where we can uh, see that um, though um, though our different local search variants have uh, rather uh, comparable solutions amongst each other, we can definitely say that the uh, variable neighborhood search that we implemented has a much a significantly lower runtime to get uh, similar solutions. And in addition, um, first come first serve rule here also serves to reduce the runtime as um, our way of evaluating the whole problem is via simulation and first come first serve significantly reduces complexity from that um, perspective. Furthermore, to go into detail about um, some uh, aspects also regarded, we have done additional tests with increasing amount of iterations throughout uh, the local searches and we can see that uh, especially uh, especially with increasing uh, increasing uh, amount of complexity with more vehicles to be scheduled at the same time going up to eight transportation vehicles at the same time um, lower amount of iterations just don't um, 
uh, start to trail behind after some time. So finally, uh, to conclude the presentations and give maybe a small outlook, that's left. The heuristic that we uh, devised provides some uh, high quality results, especially for lower numbers of vehicles in a very uh, decent time. However, increasing the problem size significantly increases the runtime of the problem. So a small outlook on what we're looking into. We are looking into the development of a tailored exact approach. Uh, as I said, currently we only compare to a quick brute force approach. And furthermore, we are looking to vary schedule at all stages to try and optimize the problem as a whole by also optimizing the scheduling at each stage. However, this would significantly increase the complexity. That is all from my side. I want to thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to have them. Thank you, Martin, for this uh, very exciting talk. Uh, I already see uh, one hand which is raised. Uh, so please, Biljana, feel free to ask your question. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this very clear presentation. Um, I have one question which might be silly um, because I'm not too familiar with um, scheduling problems in depth, but you said that you have a no waiting clause. So is this a normal assumption for this type of problem? And if it's not, why did you choose to introduce it? Well, um, there's a similar problems uh, considered uh, um, often have the issue of um, collisions to be considered like there's some there's some um, some research going into having multiple having uh, multiple different basically if we go back to the start we'll say there's some research going into having multiple different loops at the same time for example but if we have multiple different loops at the same time we have an issue that also exists if we have uh, if we allow for waiting is basically that we continuously stack up uh, we uh, well in the we uh, continuously rack up additional time that's spent uh, doing nothing basically or i mean it's also considered as a collision problem so you either say um, someone has to stop or there's a collision happening. So basically there's a collision issue that you have to regard. So in our case, if we say there's a no waiting clause, we can, if we if we let go of the AGV at the depot at a specific time, we definitely know the location of this AGV down the road at any given point in time. So starting the AGV sets it to consistently lap the entire system until uh, until everything is said and done. But if we then say in, in the future, we want to know the location of the AGV at a certain point in time, then we only have to regard the starting time as there is no waiting allowed. And uh, yeah, in current industry solutions, we believe that um, we believe that loading and unloading without any significant delay here should be a rather realistic assumption. OK, thank you. OK, and another question, uh, please, Stefan Wagner, go ahead. Thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Just one thing that I didn't quite get, the processing time that you need of the jobs on each machine. Is this processing time the same for each machine on a single stage? Or does it depend which machine I choose on a single stage, uh, how long it takes for the job to be processed? No, in our, in our case, they're considered to be the same. So we've got multiple uh, machines at the same stage that are considered uh, of to be uh, the same. So we basically, okay. we've got the flexibility by choosing one out of the machines at each stage. But it doesn't matter which machine to choose. Yes. Uh, then I didn't quite get uh, your uh, your statement that it can be possible that the jobs overtake each other. So if if I do not have a chance to be quicker on a stage than another job, by choosing a machine which is a shorter processing time, which you do not do, as you just said, how can it happen that one job can overtake another job? This is something that I... No, we consider the jobs to have uh, wholly independent processing times each. So the, the processing times depending on the job, but not on the machines. 
So we've ah, got okay. um, every ah, job has yeah, a yes. list of processing mm -hmm. times at each of the stages, okay. and these are wholly independent between jobs. Yeah, so the, the overtaking possibility mm -hmm. is because one of the jobs simply uh, takes less time at this yeah. stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and one more question from Bernhard Wert, please. Yes, uh, more in uh, a quick shot idea than an actual question, but you used a discretized time as your uh, solution encoding. Mm -hmm. And I was just uh, discussing with my colleague whether this is uh, actually necessary. Maybe, maybe, I don't know your problem well enough, but probably you can uh, collapse the time in just the sequence of events. You only need to have the, the permutation in which order the, uh, all your, your events happen, and then you can greedily select the earliest time for every uh, event as long as you keep this one uh, permutation of events. I think you don't actually need a continuous clock. You can go along with a, with a logical clock just defining which job and which uh, vehicle happens before another. I'm not sure that you that you actually need to do the discretized time, and this might be uh, of help to you, especially if you have longer stretches uh, of discretized timestamps where you're just moving the uh, the jobs to the uh, or your events to the earliest timestamp. I'm not I'm not sure that whether this applies to your problem or not. I need I probably would probably need a more more insight into that, but have you thought about uh, removing the time as a as an access for this solution? Well, we've given some thought to it, and I'm I'm not entirely sure if I understood your uh, your suggestion correctly. But I think one problem that we run into here is that um, basically, as we say, they they cycle continuously. Um, at every stage down the line, we also need to know um, where which which vehicle will pick up this job, mm -hmm. basically, which is the next incoming. Um, depending on like there's a queuing system, then obviously, since I say there's no waiting clause, there has to be a queuing system at each stage. Um, so uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, how you can how you can go from uh, from your approach to that solution, but uh, I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely give it some more thought. It it seems promising if it works. It's just that uh, basically like letting go. Uh, like the the first question that I would have for this approach would be. Um, how do you know when everything starts at the depot? So basically, if you ju if you just give them an order, then they would implement this order, no? Um, uh, actually, mm. um, Bernhard and Martin, as time is, uh, is okay. oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. quite quickly. Sorry. I, no, 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 absolutely no problem. I would have the suggestion, as I know both of you, um, I uh, we can later on um, again contact each other and um, and discuss uh, this interesting suggestion. I'd like to invite you also to our next session starting at 11 a.m. with three excellent speakers um, who all come uh, from the field of production and logistics management and tell us about their excellent research and practical implementation um, results. So thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Bye. Bye, thank bye. you. Bye bye. Good talk. Thank you. Very interesting. Bye bye. Thanks for the talk.